Fantastic. Well, my name is Frank. I'm one of the pastors. I'm glad you're here. There's always a lot going on at this church, and uh, it's uh, fun to not... Uh, to not have to try to control it and just let God do what he wants to do. And we, we're seeing lives change. We had a baptism service last night for our homeless congregation. And uh, hopefully we'll have some videos for you. That's some incredible, incredible testimony. I mean, total, complete life change. And that's what God does. And, and all of us are sort of in the same boat. We, uh, I can speak, I think, for most of us. We went through our lives thinking that we were God, or at least we, maybe we didn't need one. And then we figured out we weren't very good at it, and we ended up basically coming to a place trying to find answers. And we stumble into a place like this, and we begin to hear a message about God, and we think that we're going to learn something that we can apply, some knowledge, so that we can gain enough information to make an informed decision. And we pursue Jesus in that way, but what happens is along the way, we fall in love. And we realize that it's a relationship we're having with a very real God. And we can't explain it, we don't understand it, but our lives begin to change. We, we're not trying to change, but once we surrender to Jesus, we, we become different people. And we're drawn to new things and things happen. And it's just an incredible experience. So we come back here trying to understand it more, trying to share it with others because we want the same for them and worshiping this God that has completely changed us. Not, not we change because we want it. He completely changed the very character and nature of who we are. And we're gonna be starting a new series today called Paradox. And um, this is a series I've been thinking about for quite a while and praying about. Uh, I love new series, as you know. Um, but a paradox is a statement or concept that seems to contradict itself. Two truths that don't seem to be able to exist at the same time. A paradox is a self-contradictory kind of statement. And what it does, it forces you to either ignore it or to go deeper and try to understand it. Purpose of a paradox is to get your attention and have you look at something deeper. Statements like, less is more. The only constant is change. To save money, you have to spend money. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And my favorite is, act natural. Statements of paradox seem to allow both truths to exist at the same time. You see, our world, we've been taught a truth that comes from our world that's based on human knowledge. And God said, look, if you want to change, you've got to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, all those lies that you have believed from the world that you've been told since you were young, you've got to completely transform the way you think. We have to examine the world's truth in light of the presence of the Holy Spirit and God's truth. And since God's ways are always higher than ours, most of what God teaches us seems paradoxical to us. We think something should be true and Jesus came along and said, no, actually it's the other way around. In this series, we're gonna focus on the paradoxes in scripture. Seemingly senseless statements that draw us into deeper meaning. Each week we're gonna explore one of these paradoxical truths. When we're weak, then we're strong. The more we give, the more we receive. We must lose our life to save it. The more we surrender, the greater the victory. We see that which cannot be seen. When we bow down, we're lifted up. To live is to die, and to die is to live. The cross is foolishness to those who don't know, but strength to those who do. The scriptures are full of paradoxes. And when we learn and study God's word, we begin to understand that our entire worldview is a complete paradox. What the world says is true is not true. What the world says that God says is false is actually true. Jesus taught that his ways are higher than our ways, that we're not to lean on our own understanding, that our heart is deceptive above all things, and that the way to the natural man leads to death. Jesus invites us 
to explore the paradox of walking with Christ in a fallen world. His ways seem foolish to the wise of the world because they refuse to engage the paradox. We're going to begin a series by looking at two concepts that at first seem to be impossible to coexist. We're going to look at God's command for us to be fearfully joyful, to live in fear of the Lord and at the same time to have enormous joy in that relationship. The fear of the Lord. We're commanded to fear the Lord. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Psalm 22, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, you offspring of Israel. Psalm 103, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As a father shows compassion to his children, the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord and delights in his commandments. Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord and walks in his ways. Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Proverbs 19. The fear of the Lord leads to life, and whoever has it rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm. Isaiah 11, his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Luke 150, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. And then Psalm 115, he will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. You can't look at the scriptures without wrestling with this concept. We, we serve a God who loves us, but we are to fear him. And that fear word in Greek and Hebrew means fear. It can mean respect and dignity and honor, but it means fear. We were given by God a fight or flight response, a keen sense of fear. It's part of our survival. We're to protect our things, ourselves from things that cause us fear. And the scriptures clearly teach us that we are to fear the Lord. Throughout human history, people have feared their gods. Gods were always far away in the heavens and they toyed with mankind and they were quick to bring judgment and punish upon mankind. Those little g gods were to be feared. Both the Romans and the Greeks during the first century were worshiping gods that they truly feared. They were constantly trying to appease the gods. They were doing anything they could to deal with the fear they had of their gods. So, so to that audience, the idea of fearing the Lord made total sense. Of course, he's God. We're commanded to fear God. It's not just some idea in Scripture. It's throughout Scripture from beginning to end. Webster defines fear as an unpleasant, strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. God spoke the world into existence. Throughout scripture, he demonstrates incredible power over creation and mankind. It holds together just because Jesus says so. In the scriptures, he often brought plagues and famines and destruction in order to make his point. He created and warns of a place called hell where there's continuous gnashing of teeth and trembling and separation from God. He alone decided to create us. We are here because he decided we should be here. He decided to bring us into existence. Our next breath is solely at his discretion. He numbered our days and he will decide when it's time for us to leave this earth. He gave grave consequences and punishment for our sins, including death. He controls every bit of nature. Scripture tells us his wrath is so great no one can stand in it. People will hide in caves from him in fear, begging the rocks to fall on them. You can't understand and experience God without accepting the natural fear of the fact that he is God and we are not. 
For many people, he is their worst nightmare, and he will do exactly what he promises to do to those who don't fear him. So we have to accept the fact that God reveals himself to us, and we have to embrace fear. We're to fear the Lord and at the same time draw near to him. We're, we're to fear the Lord and rejoice with trembling. The same fear that leads to life is the beginning of wisdom, God says. You see, in our world, fear or fight or flight response is normal and natural. And mankind, because of our sin nature, rejects God, and many people walk this planet with no fear of him. At least that's what they'll tell you. One of the greatest tragedies of the current church, in my opinion today, is that we've lost our fear of God. We've made him our buddy, who we're going to reason with. When the time comes, I'll just go up there and I'll tell him, remember this, remember that, don't, don't look over there, you just remember this. And I say it all the time, when you're in front of holy God, you will be on your face losing body functions. He is holy, we are not. So fearing God is natural, but there's one problem. Unlike the gods of the Romans and Greeks who live far away supposedly up on Mount Olympus, our God chose to live with us. He was in the tabernacle in the desert. He was in the temple in Jerusalem. And now the Holy Spirit resides in each of us. We can't just avoid him, but we do have to learn and understand how to manage fear. God is clear that he created us because he wanted a relationship with us. Every person ever created is going to have some kind of relationship with holy God. And according to scripture, those who relate to him correctly have a healthy fear of him. And yet God tells us that while our relationship is based on fear, it also brings great joy. How can we find great joy in somebody we truly fear? Our natural response is to fight or flight, not draw near in love. Many have experienced those fears and were forced into a relationship with people that treated them poorly. Many of us, our experience of fear is a relationship with maybe an earthly father who abused us, and we never found joy in that relationship. How, how, why would we draw near to somebody we fear? Yet God's word tells us we are to joyfully fear the Lord. You beginning to see the paradox? How can we experience joy and fear at the same time? Well, maybe we should look to Jesus and see what he did. Jesus was a man of sorrows. Isaiah 53, 3, he was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You look at Jesus's life on earth, he clearly understood sorrow. At the same time though, in John, he says this, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she's delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, he says, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Jesus tells us as believers that we already have joy and it can't be taken away from us. You may be asking, if I'm so full of joy, why am I so unhappy? Why don't I experience this joy that you're talking about? Hold on for a few moments and we'll get there. Pay very close attention to the words of Jesus. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus says, my joy. 
my joy in you. Not just that you'll experience some joy, not that you'll have some kind of joy like you learned on earth, but the joy that is in you comes straight from the throne of God. It'll be part of your nature. It will define who you are as a reinstated child of God. Jesus says, look, you've already got it. It's in you. If you've received the Holy Spirit, if you've in faith have surrendered to Christ, there's an enormous joy inside of you waiting to get out. But the key word is my joy. He's telling you, you're going to be born again. And part of your new nature is you're going to have a capacity for incredible joy. Not something you obtain, not something you try to figure out how to do, not something you decide to do. You have a reborn nature, and part of that nature of every believer is a capacity for incredible joy. What separates those who've received the Holy Spirit from those who have not, one thing is joy. We're given the Spirit, and he grows in us fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such things, there's no law. Another way of saying is, look, the evidence of a new and changed nature, when you're reborn and you want to look at your life and say, am I changed? What's happened to me? I surrendered to Christ. I received the Holy Spirit. And in me now, things are changing. I'm developing a love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, forbearance, self. I've got all this stuff and it's in me and I never did that before. I have compassion for people I never had compassion for. I have a love that's not of me, it's coming through me. Things are being expressed in my life to other people and I know I'm not doing it. So you may be thinking right now, look, I know I love Jesus and I know I've been reborn and I get that God produces fruit in me, but I'm really unhappy. The joy all my friends keep talking about is foreign to me. I have moments of happiness and joy, but they don't define me. They're not part of my character. They, they seem really rare, and when I try to hold on to them, they go away. I can't fake joy, and I can't fake happiness. Maybe I'm not saved. My answer is you and I were never promised happiness from God. God, in fact, promised the opposite. He said we'd suffer and have many trials. He said tomorrow has its troubles of its own. We're called to embrace suffering just like Jesus did. We were never promised a wrinkle-free life as a believer of Jesus. He did, however, promise to give us his joy. Joy that doesn't come from this world. Joy that you can't fake and you can't force to happen. The joy Jesus promised is something that's part of us at our rebirth. It doesn't come from this world. It's not of this world, and this world does not understand it. And it makes no sense to us. But joy is not happiness. In fact, joy can abound in some of the most unhappy moments in our lives. Joy is a deep, unwavering experience in the core of our being that no matter what happens to me, all is well. We often sing, it is well with my soul. As God's beloved children, we're blessed with the joy of the Lord and we don't depend on the happiness of this world. Happiness depends on what's happening in your life. If you wanna know what happiness is, it's, it's your interpretation of what's happening in your life. Joy is way beyond that. Joy isn't affected at all by what's happening in your life. Joy is a deep river that runs through your soul because the Holy Spirit is in you as you experience these events of your life. The joy of the Lord is far different than just happiness. Unsaved people may experience happiness, but only true believers in Jesus Christ have this deeper, more satisfying joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord depends on the Holy Spirit in us, not what's happening around us. You can be full of enormous joy and have your world falling apart from your perspective. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. He promises to grow in us these fruits. Fruit of the Spirit. Look at the fruits again. 
love, joy, peace. As you read those, here's what I want you to think. Those are heavenly gifts come to you. You're not given the love the world knows. You're given God's love to pour out on other people. You're given God's peace in your soul. You're given God's joy in your soul. It will grow in you as you mature in Christ. These things become more and more part of not what you're doing, but your very essence and character. Straight from the throne of God, a supernatural experience that flows through us to other people has nothing to do with the circumstances of our lives. So no matter what is happening, we can experience God's joy and we can say from our hearts, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. It's a joy produced by the Father, given by the Son, and nourished by the Spirit. When we study Jesus, we see a man that knew trials and suffering. He knew the cross was his destiny, and yet he seemed to have something different that allowed him to live, it seems, above his circumstances. It was like the things they wanted to do to him didn't seem to faze him. He had this inner sense of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, and he demonstrated to us the joy of the Lord. Not the happiness of man, but the joy that comes from the Spirit. So you may be asking, if I'm so full of this joy, why do I not experience it? Why are we not known to be the most joyous people in our environment? Why is it when we leave this room, people don't look at us and go, wow, that's somebody that has joy. Instead, we just seem burdened. Your answer is found in John 15. If you want the cliff note version, here it is. You don't experience his joy. You and I don't experience his joy because we're not abiding in him. Period. Simple. Those who abide in Christ, those who spend time with Christ, those who prioritize that time above everything else in their lives, those who spend time with God begin to reflect the nature and character of the Holy Spirit. And those who don't, don't. You can be a saved believer in Jesus Christ, full of the full potential of the Holy Spirit, full of everything he wants to do in you, but if you're not abiding, you're not gonna grow fruit. Everything that happens to you it, from a sense of spiritual fruit comes from the time you spend with God. The more time you prioritize with God every day, the more fruit's gonna flow through you, the more you're gonna experience his joy. Those who don't spend time with God, who try to live their Christian life just coming to church and volunteering, who aren't spending time in the Word, aren't spending time praying, aren't spending time listening to God, they're not going to grow fruit because they're going to keep it bottled up inside of them. Jesus promises, a, prom a promise from Jesus, from God, that if they abide in Him, they will produce the fruit of the Spirit. You've been given secret powers by God. You possess a supernatural love of God. You possess an inexpressible joy of God, the overwhelming peace of God and every other fruit promised in the scriptures. Well, you have it. You don't need more of it. You have it. The key that unlocks that is simple. Spend prioritized and surrendered time with the Holy Spirit and he'll make changes in you. It's a promise straight from Jesus. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. It's a promise. You abide in me, you're gonna have stuff flowing through you. You don't even know where it came from. You just know it's incredible. You don't, you're gonna miss out. If you try to live out your new life in Christ without prioritizing your daily time in prayer, your Bible study, your scripture meditation, listening to God, listening to worship music, you will live fruitless lives as a saved believer. But if you surrender, if, if you surrender your time, 
If you actually turn off that computer and get on your knees and talk to somebody who can actually change something, you will begin to experience the fruit of God. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Zero, zip, nada, nothing. It's so important that he repeats it. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Notice the branch, you and me, cannot produce fruit without a connection to the vine, which is Jesus. Too many believers are trying to make things happen in their lives instead of surrendering and letting God do what he wants to do. I say it all the time. Surrender so he can change you more. If your life is not characterized by supernatural love and joy and peace, all these things, there's only three reasons. One, you've never truly repented, surrendered to Jesus, and received the Holy Spirit. Second, you're saved, but you don't spend any time with Christ. You're trying to live your walk through somebody else. You think that just coming to church is going to change you. It's not. The change happens in the quiet moments of your soul. I say it all the time. I can't spend time with God for you. There's a place, a God waiting to meet with you to tell you things about your life. We have to prioritize our time listening to God. The third thing is you're saved and you spend time with Christ, but there's an unrepentant sin that you refuse to ask for forgiveness. You refuse to confess. If you're a Christ follower who lacks fruit in your life, it's caused by disobedience not prioritizing your time with God or not agreeing with Christ about your sins or both. You and I need to fix it right now. You need to leave this room and I need to leave this room committed that nothing stands in the way of me meeting with my Savior every single day. Delayed obedience is disobedience. So let's look a deep, bit deeper at this joy. In the lost, uh, we call the lost parables in Luke, um, it's interesting that there's three examples of great joy in the Bible that go right along with the vine. The stories go right with it. The shepherd rejoiced when he found his lost sheep. The woman said she found her lost coin. The father's lost son has come home and they share their joy with other people. Because we abide in Christ, our circumstances no longer define our experiences. Paul wrote from prison, from prison, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Peter described our joy as being inexpressible and full of glory. We experience it, but we can't explain it because it's not a head thing, it's a heart thing. Besides our salvation and the joy of leading others to Christ, we have all kinds of reasons to be rejoicing. For one, we have hope. We have hope that one day we'll stand in the presence of Jesus himself. Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. One of the great reasons we have joy is because we have hope. Not only do we have hope, but we continually receive the blessings of the Lord. His word is the greatest blessing you're given. God gave us literally his word, his spoken truth, his inspired word. You have it around. You can read it. You can hear from God. You can talk to God about it. The word of God is an incredible source of great joy. The psalmist said, your testimonies are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. Jeremiah, your words were found and I ate them and your words became to me a joy and a delight of my heart for I'm called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. Whenever I've been in painful circumstances, whenever I've been tempted to take my eyes off of Jesus and look at my world, the promises of God are what encourage me and bring me back to where I need to be. They connect me with the joy that's in me. And they did the same thing for the believers at Thessalonica. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord for you received the word with much affliction. 
with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Notice what joy, the Holy Spirit's joy. So that you became an example to all believers. In other words, when you're going through difficult times and the joy of God flows through you, other people see that. We also experience great joy because we have the opportunity to share the word of God with other people. And one day we'll stand with them as they come into glory. Psalm 126, those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing the sheaves in with him. We have reasons for joy because we have answered prayers. We've seen God work in our lives. Jesus says, until now you've asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy, there it is, may be full. Jesus wants us to be filled with the joy that's in us. He wants us to live for all that rejoices in him. He says, but now I'm coming to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy filled in themselves. Jesus says, look, I want you to experience the full joy of the Lord every single day, no matter what happens in your circumstances. But Satan's a joy stealer. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to keep you and I from experiencing the joy that God has already given to us. Satan can't do anything about your salvation, but he can keep you from experiencing the fruit of that reality. Most Christians that I know who struggle fully experiencing the joy of the Lord, they're not where they need to be in abiding with Christ. Satan does not want you to know the power that you possess. Satan does not want you to be aware at all of the gifts that the Spirit is ready to flow through you and change your life. He'll do anything to keep you from doing that. C.S. Lewis said, faith in Jesus Christ not only gives us forgiveness of our sins, but the joys of knowing God's will, the power to obey his will, the reward of knowing we're pleasing sovereign God. Satan wants you to not know that. So how does he keep you from experiencing the joy that God's put in you? He'll do anything he can to keep you from your quiet time with God every day. Don't believe me? Set it up. Watch what happens. Satan can't steal your salvation, but he's hell-bent on keeping you and me from showing God's truth to a starving world. Supernatural joy is not stagnant. Satan wants to keep you and I from experiencing it, and Jesus wants to reveal it. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. The one thing non-believing world should see in us is unwavering joy and love and peace that extends beyond our circumstances. We should be known for that. We should live bulletproof lives. We're knowing nothing can touch us. We're eternal beings having a human experience. We'll leave this place. We'll go right to heaven. We should be bulletproof. Nothing in this world can impact our relationship with God or the fact that we have the power of God in us and the joy that comes from that reality. So I just wonder if Looking in on your life and my life and remnant, do people walk away going, wow, now they're different. They have joy. No matter what happens to them, they, they're not in denial. It's not like they're just saying, I'll be okay. They truly are okay. I had friends in the same circumstance who were totally freaking out. They're, they're okay. I don't get it. You see, the fruit of the Spirit should tempt the non-believers looking in just like the fruit tempted Eve. Are you known to be a joyful person? Have you shared with other people the joy that you have inside? Or have you just decided that's just yours? If not, you've probably not spent enough time abiding in Christ. Not my words. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. He continues, 
By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. How will you know the disciples of Jesus Christ? You will see the fruit in them being expressed. And why is Jesus speaking these things? That my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. So we're to have full joy. Yet at the same time, we're to fear the Lord. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those who fear the Lord find life. The Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. How can we fear God and experience his joy at the same time? Well, you and I can't. We can't leave this room today and just decide to do it. Let's look a bit deeper. The fear of the Lord is the reverent respect for God that is born not of terror, but of knowledge, love, and faith. The better we know God, the more we love and trust him, the more we want to please him. In the spiritual life, joy without fear can be shallow and careless, and fear without joy can be destructive. Terror paralyzes us, but godly fear energizes us. It's a great source of power, Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Respect for authority opens the doors of learning and living spiritually. The phrase is fear of the Lord and fear of God are used more than 100 times in Scripture. The believers in the early church walked in awe of the Lord, and so should we, and they were happy about it. Acts 9.31, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. There's the paradox. Fear of the Lord and at the same time the comfort and joy of the Holy Spirit. At one level, fear of the Lord is the same as faith in the Lord. When people of the Israel crossed the Red Sea, they started out in fear. They ended up in faith. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so they feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. When we're young believers, we're full of joy. Our sins are forgiven. We're learning from the scriptures. We have a new church family. The Holy Spirit's enabled us to walk in victory. We've overcome the things. We've been baptized. We're full of joy. We can't wait for that door to open so we can come in this place. We didn't think our lives would ever change, but it did. And now it's like God has given us new glasses and everything seems new and we're full of joy. And our faith begins to grow and become stronger, but we suddenly fall under tests. We're confronted by the world, the flesh, the devil. Paul told the Ephesians, you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. We have an enormous joy because we realize we've been delivered from the person we used to be. Occasionally, we, after finding that joy, begin to do some things that dishonor God. We confess our sins, and we go right back to that joy again. The psalmist said, restore me to the joy of your salvation. When I confess my sins, the joy returns. We remember his promises to forgive, so we just get up and go again. But Satan doesn't want you to be joyful. He begins to accuse you. He wants the memories of your past sins to haunt you today. He wants the fear of tomorrow to haunt you today. He'll do anything to keep you from living in the moment. And particularly if that moment is abiding with Christ. When you're tempted, Satan whispers at you, don't worry, you'll get away with it. And then as soon as you sin, he says, you'll never get away with that. The fear of the Lord moved in and began to wonder, would the Father chasten us? Would, would the Lord and the fear of the Lord be replaced by joyful fear or not? I want you to understand something. We're not talking about a roller coaster here. 
We're not talking about how you'll have several days of joy followed by several days of um, fear, followed by several days of joy, followed by several days of fear. The scriptures teach us that we have joy and fear at the same time, all times. That we'll have joy in the Lord at the same time, we will fear the Lord. If there's one thing that's needed in the church today, it's a holy reverence and awe and a genuine fear of God and what he will do. If not for yourself, then for the lost people. Just as children must learn to respect their parents, students need to respect their teachers, military men and women, their officers, so God's children need to learn to respect and honor God so they may grow into the love of God. After Paul listed the godless activities of a sinful world, he explained why men and women live that way. You want to know what's wrong with our world? You want to know why the world's doing crazy things? Romans 3.18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. There's no fear of judgment that makes people run and hide like Adam and Eve did. There's no fear of the unknown like the people of Israel reaching Mount Sinai. In our world of scientific wonders, we think we know everything and can control everything. But then, like this week, hurricanes come. We go to a hiding place and people who are atheists start praying. You can run, but you can't hide. Ecclesiastes, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, every secret thing, good or evil. But the fear of the child of God is not, will he hurt me? As children of God, we don't walk around going, oh, he's going to hurt me. We're going to grieve our sins because it's going to affect our relationship with God. We're told, do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Our disobedience grieves the Holy Spirit. Just as a stubborn child grieves their parents. You want to move your children from a place of, will this hurt others, instead of, will this hurt me? Scriptures say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowing and respecting instructors and people of authority and the lessons they teach. A lot of people are seeking knowledge, which deals primarily with people, place, things, facts, and events. But God calls us to move to wisdom, which puts it all together and reveals values and principles and truths. So we're to have continuous fear of the Lord, awe, respect, wonder, reverence, surrender. And we're to have fearful joy of the world. My dad was six feet tall, weighed 140 pounds on his heaviest day. None of his body was muscle. I, my dad was a nerdy accountant. I never told anyone my dad could beat up their dad, never, not once. My dad was awkward physically and socially, particularly around my friends. But I feared him. The last thing I ever wanted to do was disappoint him. As a young child at times, I was in abject fear of my dad. Just wait till your dad comes home. I knew exactly what that meant. But as I grew up, I spent more time with him. As I matured, I began to understand him better. I began to learn that he was my greatest cheerleader. He disappointed. He disciplined me because he loved me. He loved me and would have and did anything for me. He supported and encouraged me in everything I ever did. He wanted the absolute best for me. The more and better that I understand him, the more I find joy in that relationship. And it sustained me long after his death. Over time, the joy of our relationship seemed to shrink the fear, but I'll tell you, the fear never went away. I still hear his voice in my head. And even though I found joy in our relationship, I never stopped fearing him at some level. In fact, the more our relationship grew, the more I resolved not to disappoint him. The key was in the relationship. 
As I matured in our relationship, I learned how to let joy and fear coexist together. Not one or the other, not one followed by the other, both always at the same time. The scriptures are rich with narratives about God's people who, enjoy, who experience the joyful fear of the Lord. Beginning with Abraham's offering of his son Isaac and closing with the book of Revelation where 26 times you find Jesus the lamb, but you also find Jesus the lion. The lamb died for our sins, but those who oppose him will discover that the lamb is also the lion who punishes rebellious sinners. Our Lord demonstrates the balance between the joy of the Lord and the fear of the Lord. At transfiguration, one of the greatest moments of Jesus' life on earth, he's on top of the mountain being transfigured, literally showing his glory to his disciples. And in that moment, do you know what he's talking about? Crucifixion. His death on the cross that was coming up in just a few days. The Hebrews writer says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Later in the series, we're going to look at another paradox about the glory of suffering. The prophet Isaiah said his delight is in the fear of the Lord. Most people who don't have a relationship with the Holy Spirit fear our God. They won't admit it. They won't tell you. But often I'll tell them, you know, in the quietness of your soul, when it's just you and nobody else, and if there's a God, he's listening. You know, in that moment, I know you have it. Don't say you don't. Something inside of every one of us tells us there is a creator God who wants to connect with us. But they don't want to think about it because it immediately brings fear. They know what they've done. These seats are not empty because people don't know what churches do. They're empty because people are afraid of what God's going to do. I hear it all the time. If I walk in, the building's going to fall down. No, it's not. It'll be built up. Just wait. They pray to a God they say they don't believe in that there's no hell. They fear his power, his authority, his judgment, his truth. But they deny him because they don't want to think about it. They live in fear, and honestly, they should. It's easier to say that there's no God than it is to deal with the fear of the fact that there probably is. They try to put him out of their minds, but in the process, they go out of their minds. Without the Holy Spirit, the best thing they can do is to live in abject fear of God. It's only through the Spirit that we're able to have joy added to that. In the letter to Philippians, Paul mentions joy 18 times. And yet he commands his believers to work out faith with fear. Therefore, my beloved, you've always obeyed, so now not in my presence, but much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work his good pleasure. So what are we to do with this? I mean, what do we, we do? We have joy that may or may not be expressed. We surrender to God. We live in fear of God. We understand him. We understand his power and his authority and his majesty. We bow down to worship to him. What do we do when we leave this room? Well, it's really simple. The more time you spend surrendered to the Holy Spirit, the greater your joy and the less your fear. The more time you invest in your relationship with Jesus Christ through your quiet time and surrender and prayer and worship, and the less you allow Satan to get you too busy to do the only important thing you have to do every day, you will find that as you abide, just like Jesus promises, joy will begin to flood your soul. You begin to experience the joy that God has already put in you, just waiting to be expressed. We have, to, I don't know how to say this, any, we have to commit to spending time alone with the Holy Spirit every single day. No one can meet God with you, for you, and you can't grow fruit through somebody else's connection to the vine. 
Over time with Christ, I know deep in my soul that I deeply fear him. But I also receive great joy from him. Joyful fear makes total sense to me. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you give us your word and your truth so we're not trying to flounder down here by ourselves. You give us the Holy Spirit who teaches all things. And Satan is here trying to keep us from doing the very simple one thing we have to do to change everything about our lives. God, I pray for each person within my voice, either online or here, that we would prioritize time with you above every single thing in our day. We not allow Satan to get us too busy. And that we meet with you with the intent of staying for a while, not just talking to you, but listening for you. Studying your word, processing your word, praying your word, meditating on your word. God, I know that you want to grow incredible joy and incredible fruits in this church. May you give us the power to meet with you each day. And would you meet us there and please don't leave us where we're at. Show us things we can't imagine. Reveal to us the plans you have for us that are plans for good and not for disaster to give us a future and a hope. God, help us to be so full of fruit that we pour out your love to those who desperately need it and don't know about it. Our lives are a greater witness than our words. Help us, God, to go out into the world with your love, your joy, your peace, your patience, your kindness, your self-control. Because when Christ is lifted up, all men are drawn. May that be the case for us. We ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you.